Today, there are seven COVID deaths in Chomburi. And more than a hundred in the country. The numbers will rise for a while. We will see the high numbers for two more weeks after Songkran. We chose to celebrate the Songkran festival during the pandemic. Khao San Road and Pattaya were very crowded. The celebration was widespread, so do not blame anyone. A 26-year-old died today in Chomburi. We should live carefully and responsibly. Do not think death comes only with old age. Do not be careless because you are young. Death is uncertain. Children die. While some people live past 100. We cannot be careless because we are youthful and healthy. Live carefully for both worldly and dharma aspects. Remind yourself that you may face illness or death at any time. You may part with someone or something you love at any time. You may face something very unpleasant at any time. Remind yourself every day. There is a common Buddhist prayer. Chara Dhamo Mahi Charung Anatito. From Ungu Tara Nikaya 5.57. We will all face aging. There is no exception. We will all face illness. There is no exception. We will all face death. There is no exception. We will all face parting from things we love and everything we hold dear. We will eventually face what is not lovable, not agreeable, nor to our choosing at any moment in time. Remind yourself every day, so you will have mindfulness in daily life. Carry out your responsibilities to the best of your abilities. So you will not have any regrets. For instance, some never show their parents their affections. They treat their parents with bitterness or disrespect. They then regret their behavior after their parents passing, lighting incense to tell the parents in the afterlife how much they are loved. Why did they not show the love when the parents were still alive? Or, they give their parents favorite food to the monks. Hoping to have the monks act as a carrier to give their parents their favorite food in the afterlife. This is too silly. With mindfulness, you realize that parting can occur at any time. So, you carry out your responsibilities to the best of your abilities. Being a layperson, you make a living. Take care of your family. And support the Buddha's teachings. 
It is not only done by donation or building physical objects. We support it by preserving the Buddha's teachings by understanding them. It is not only done by donation or building physical objects. Is donating needy physical objects good? It is, but we can do a lot better. Many temples now focus on getting donations, even though the laypeople are poor. Some resort to deceiving, deceiving by advertising, that buying certain amulets or holy objects will result in gaining wealth. The majority of people do not understand what the Buddha taught. So do not prey on them. Is there such a thing as a wealthy amulet? No, it is impossible. It is against the teachings. If you do not work and save diligently, choose your friends wisely, or keep indulging yourself in a apa ya mukha gateway to ruins, for example, gambling, drinking, you will never be wealthy. The world is full of people who are trying to take advantage of others. The current form of Buddhism is not pure. Many beliefs, like worshipping the ghosts of the ancestors, are mixed in. This is because these were local beliefs before Buddhism got here. So, this is mixed with Buddhism and there are some strange results. If a temple dug up a stump, they may worship it. The temple makes money by selling flowers, candles, and incense as objects of worship. They also sell colored strip cloths to wind around the stump. This is encouraging people who are ignorant to be even more superstitious, which is comforting to them. But, people who want to study Buddhism, will have a harder time understanding its true teachings. They think, Buddhism, will make them fortunate and wealthy. When they get sick, they ask for blessings to be free from the sickness. There are some people who came to ask me for the same blessing. But they should know that I myself get sick. Do not be superstitious. If we allow superstition to continue, we will not fully benefit from the Buddha's teachings. At most, we get some peace of mind. This is the same peace of mind ostriches get when they bury their heads under their own wings. When they do not see the enemy, they feel the threat no longer exists. This is self-delusion, and we must not delude ourselves. One of my teachers, Luang Por Pang Ya, opposed shrine worship. The forest monks, led by Luang Pu Mun, also opposed this as well. They tried to persuade folks to stop worshipping shrines for the past elders. A hundred years have passed since, but this tradition still continues. Its root runs deep. Real Buddhism starts to disappear instead. So, 
We cannot assume that Buddhism is well established. If we do not study or practice, Buddhism may disappear at any time. If we think that death is still a distant event, we will be careless. We hope to start practicing when death is approaching. If we take that view, we may never start practicing. Some people think they will start practicing when they turn 50. But they may die before then. These people were careless. For you guys, you have heard the Buddha's teachings. Knowing the teachings but failing to get the full benefit. We need to practice until we see the truth in them. By not practicing is careless. Buddhism may disappear at any time. It usually does not last long. Because it is hard to understand. It promotes self-reliance. Most people are too weak to rely on themselves. And hope to get by with blessings. So, be diligent. Once you know the teachings, you must practice. Practicing is not just about sitting or walking meditation. That is not sufficient. If we never had good moral conduct, having resolution to have good conduct is a beginning. We are following his teachings. We do not procrastinate by putting off practicing. Make a strong resolution to keep the five precepts. At first, it may be difficult because most people today do not keep them. So, following the five precepts may look weird in other people's views. But we must persevere. Good things come to those who persevere. I know that as a layperson. Keeping the five precepts pristinely is difficult. But we must persevere. For myself, I got drunk only a couple of times. When it could not be avoided. The first time I got drunk was when I was a freshman at the university. The more senior students coerced me to drink. I know that it would be very hard to fit in at school if I did not comply. So, I had to drink a bit and fake my drunkenness. I tried to avoid the same situation afterwards. When I started working in the public sector, seniority was taken seriously. I had to avoid drinking with my superiors. If I sat at the same table as my superiors. I poured a few drops of coke into a glass of soda. So my drink would look like whiskey and soda. Today's society is one without moral precepts. So we must persevere and be smart to preserve our precepts. That is a practice. Set aside some free time every day to formally practice. If you do not know any practice, remind yourself of death. We do not know when it is our time to go. We do not know whether we may get a serious illness that totally disables us. Remind yourself every day, so you will be diligent. To be frequently mindful of our eventual death is called Maranasati. Practicing it gives stability and peace of mind. For example, if your mind is too diffused, full of greed or anger. Be mindful of your eventual death. All your physical belongings will be left behind after you die.
This also includes your wealth and family. They all vanish. If you are mindful of death, your greed or lust will subside. Your anger or vengeful thoughts will subside. Being mindful that you and your nemesis will eventually all die. People in the Ayodhya dynasty, circa add 1350 to 1767, fought and killed for power. There were winners and losers. Today, there is no winner left. The winners back in the day are now dead. Being mindful of death often will make you realize the worthlessness of anger. We all part ways after not too long anyway. The same applies to greed and lust. Practice Maranasati often. The Buddha even said that he saw death in every moment. I used to not understand why. How could he do other activities while being mindful of death in every moment? After practice, I know. We constantly have death. When we breathe in, the body that breathed out has passed. And vice versa for breathing out. We die when we change from breathing in to breathing out. We die from the previous posture when we change it. We die from the sitting posture when we lie down or stand up. We die from the previous posture when we change it. We die when we change from breathing in to breathing out. If we are constantly mindful of these events, the mind will automatically be at peace. It will see its own struggles, clinging to its dear things, and being hateful as worthless. Eventually, it all becomes emptiness. If you do not know any other practice, being mindful of death is the easiest practice you can do. The next task is wisdom cultivation. Once the mind is calm and serene, do not languish in it. You must cultivate wisdom. If you previously had no moral conduct and now you do, this is diligence. But once you have moral conduct and you do not develop further, this is negligent. Next, you develop the mind to be peaceful and stable, having samadhi. This is diligence. But once you have samadhi and you languish in it, it is negligence again. Negligence means not diligently developing good qualities. So, you practice every day. Until the mind becomes peaceful, free from lust, greed, anger, vengeance, or fear. Practice until the mind is impartial to everything. Then the mind will have strength to do wisdom cultivation. Two years ago, when COVID just broke out, we heard the news that in Europe and the Americas, the funeral and burial capacities could not keep up with the number of deaths. We were panicking. Our minds lost their impartiality because of fear. Later, we started facing economic hardship. And the impartiality was gone because of our frustration and anger. Now, most of us are vaccinated and COVID is becoming endemic. We feel safer, but we may forget about our old relatives. They may get severe symptoms from infections. Some of us now party hard to make up for lost party time. The lust to embrace sensual pleasures is too wild. The wild minds are also in delusions. 
Can you see that COVID has taught us about our mind's impurities? We saw fear, anger, lust, and delusions. Now that we are not so afraid of COVID anymore, we become mindlessly indulging ourselves in worldly pleasure. So, we must be diligent to train ourselves. If you can develop wisdom, do so. Pick a practice object. Like breathing, death. Some sharing and giving that we have done, or some pristine moral conduct that we have done. We can also remind ourselves of the Buddha, his teachings, his disciples, or other good people. This is called Devatanusati, mindful of beings of exemplary characters. Or you can remind yourself of your mind's peacefulness. That is lost through seeking worldly pleasures. If you have practiced until you have experienced peacefulness before, the mind will realize that it has lost its peacefulness. It will try to gain peacefulness back. Reminding oneself of peacefulness is called Upasamonasati. Reminding yourself of death is called Maranasati. You can remind yourself of breathing, seeing one death in body breathing out, and another death in body breathing in. Seeing oneself getting closer to death in every breath is called Anapanasati. You can consider the body, seeing that the body is only composed of physical elements, head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, muscles, ligaments, and bones consist of the earth elements, blood, pus, saliva, or urine consists of the water element. Google for the 32 parts of the body. Reminding oneself of those objects is called Kayagatasati, mindfulness of the body. So, we practice with an object to attain peacefulness. Mindfulness of death is the ultimate practice to obtain peacefulness. I heard from Luang Pu Ted, myself. He said that, sometimes, by using other practice objects, like mindfulness of the unpleasant and decaying characteristics of the body, the mind still does not free itself from raga, lust and greed. So, the ultimate move is to be mindful of death. Is the mind still full of lust and greed? Like being attracted to a very beautiful woman, consider how desirable her body is if she dies. Nobody will want her dead body. So, if you cannot become peaceful by using other practice objects, a strong medicine for it is mindfulness of death. Once death reaches you and someone you hold dear, nothing matters anymore. Once you see this, your mind will be free from nivarana, hindrances of the mind's stability, which is hindering the mind from attaining development. The five hindrances are kamachanda, sensual pleasures. Bhayapada, sensual displeasures. Diffusion and agitation, doubt, and gloom and lethargy. Once the mind has stability, it will be free from these five hindrances. These five hindrances prevent further development. They are eliminated by having samadhi, stability and concentration. With samadhi, they are temporarily subsided, but will return. So, the battle with them will have many rounds. Sometimes you win, and sometimes they win. If you have stability, the hindrances will be eliminated. Once the stability is lost, the hindrances will come back. We should use the time when the mind is having stability, free from hindrances. to cultivate wisdom. We cultivate wisdom by learning the truth of the mind and the body with mindfulness. Observe the body and mind with an impartial, stable mind. 
This is called Satipatthana, mindfulness practice. So, we have mindfulness to observe phenomena of the mind and body as they are. What is the body as it is? What is the mind as it is? They are impermanent, full of conflict and decay, and are not self. Perceive the impermanence, conflict and decay, and non-self nature of the body. Do the same thing for the mind. Perceiving or noticing is like a mind's viewpoint. It is not thinking. It is like this, if the mind is observing the body, and it feels that, this is my body, shift the perspective a little and see that the body is just an object, and it is not yours. Human language cannot convey this subtlety well. How much is perceiving or noticing? If you bend the observation too much, it will be thinking. It is difficult to explain. Perceive and notice that the object is not self. It is more about perceiving than thinking. If the mind runs along the line of this is a physical object, this is, then it is thinking. Just perceive the movement of this object and notice its selflessness. It is not a living being. It is not someone. Perceive correctly. Take your time to practice perceiving and noticing. At first, you may not perceive correctly. Do not worry about it. For example, if the mind is already peaceful, but cannot perceive the body as impermanent, in conflict and decay, and not self, then just think about the body. Analyze it like this. This body is impermanent. It was once a child, now it is fully grown. Soon it will be old. Think and analyze the body. This body is just a collection of elements. Elements flow in and out constantly. Lead the mind with thinking. This is not yet perception. But it will stimulate the mind to start perceiving. Trilaksana, the three characteristics, of the body. You can do the same thing for the mind. If you start with the body, start by thinking. This body is not permanent. The skins are now showing wrinkles. It is old, and death will arrive soon. Keep examining. Later, when the mind is stable and the body moves, the perceiving will occur automatically. The mind will see that the body is not a human, a living being, or a someone. The perception will arise automatically without thinking. Thinking can be a starting point. Once you can perceive, you will start to be able to observe it. Further thinking will be proper. as in seeing the object's impermanence, conflict and decay nature, and selflessness. The perception will be correct, and this results in having the right view. So, be mindful of the body and mind. Know the body as it is. Know the mind as it is. This is called having mindfulness knowing the body and the mind as they are. Wisdom will develop only when the mind is stable and impartial. Wisdom is the imminent result of samadhi, stability and concentration of the mind. A few days ago, I saw a Dharma teaching video clip. The presenter said that samadhi is unnecessary. He himself has practiced it for a long time without reaping any benefit. This view is misleading. Right samadhi, right stability and concentration, is the imminent cause of wisdom, but wrong samadhi is not. That person probably had that view. Because he was practicing wrong samadhi, he did not know the right one. Just seeing his face on the video clip told me so. The mind was not truly stable. It was diffused. Diffusion in Dharma is not seeing Dharma. Diffusion in Dharma is the enemy of seeing it. The mind that is diffused in Dharma is consumed by Uddhajya, diffusion and restlessness. If you observe carefully, you will see that diffusion and restlessness lead to Kukkujya, agitation. The mind will be agitated and irritated.
nothing seems to go right, and one may conclude from that experience that, all kinds of samadhi, stability, are not useful. Why so? Because that person has never known the right samadhi, stability. This is what I am teaching you. You must have mindfulness when you practice samadhi, stability. If you lack mindfulness, the samadhi that you have will not be proper. In sitting posture, you may become sleepy. That is wrong samadhi. Stress and tension are also symptoms of wrong samadhi. Doing wrong samadhi meditation can lead to seeing mental visions like seeing ghosts, the past, the future, or your previous lives. There is no way for you to check whether what you see is true. People tend to see mental visions of themselves being someone very important in their past lives. They never recall being dogs or cats in their previous lives. A master who really had the capability to recollect his previous lives told the students that he was a dog for 500 lives consecutively. That one is real, but the mind's full of impurities. Always recall being someone of historical significance. I have heard of a dozen people who claimed they were King Nureshwen in one of their previous lives. This is the result of wrong samadhi, stability. When they practice samadhi with egocentric minds, that will be the kind of mental visions they see. This kind of samadhi practice is useless. So, samadhi, stability, practice must be accompanied by mindfulness. When the mind wanders off into the realm of thoughts, no so. When the mind follows the light of the mental vision, no so. This prevents delusions. The mind will become a stable, awakened, and blissful knower. Once it is, cultivate wisdom. Do so by having mindfulness observing. Trilaksana, the three characteristics, of the body. When mindfulness knows the mental compositions, you will also see their trilaksana, the three characteristics. This is wisdom cultivation. It cannot be done without samadhi. But if your samadhi is improper, abandon it. A while ago, I visited a few groups of practitioners from many schools. After a while, the conclusion was that most of them lacked proper samadhi, stability and concentration. Their minds were not stable, impartial, or mindful. Their minds were not free from greed, aversion, or delusions. Their minds were not light, soft, gentle, quick, or agile. Their minds were too lazy to observe trilaksana, the three characteristics. Their minds observe and interfere with the phenomena because of their partiality. Their minds interfered with the observation. They lacked proper samadhi. The minds were unwholesome. That kind of samadhi is not beneficial. Do not practice it. So, it is partially true when some teachers say samadhi is not necessary for practice. The wrong kind of samadhi is not necessary, and unlearning it is difficult. But proper samadhi is essential. Without the right samadhi, right insight, seeing the truth, will not occur. Without right insight, right liberation will not occur. So, right samadhi is necessary. Practicing mindfulness by observing the body and mind as they are. With a stable and impartial mind is of great merit. It will yield great results. Suppose we never had a stable mind. The first time the mind becomes stable. You will feel like you have just awakened. You will know that you have been living your life asleep. You were living in dreams. Once a stable mind is achieved, you will know that, up to that point, only the body was awake, but the mind had always been in delusions and dreams. The mind had never awakened and detached itself from the realm of thoughts. Once a stable mind is achieved, a knowing mind arises, and the mind truly wakes up. So, it used to be rare to find people who are really awake. Recently, there has been more and more awakeness. I speak about this topic a lot. 
and this results in many of you waking up. Shortly before this, I visited many schools and saw people practicing samadhi while being immersed in delusions or practicing samadhi with intense focus. These two types of minds are not the awake, knowing mind, but they are full of delusions or stress from self-control. These are wrong samadhi, stability and concentration. If you have the right samadhi, stability and concentration, and the mind is truly a knowing mind, wisdom will develop. If true wisdom cultivation is taking place, it will not take long for the mind to see and accept the truth. Enlightenment will happen. This will not take much time. It takes a long time because the mind is not of sufficient quality. If you practice with a mind fully immersed in raga, lust and greed, dosa, anger and agitation, or moha, delusions or ignorance, the mind's impurities will develop instead. So, before cultivating wisdom, a wholesome mind is necessary. It must have samadhi, stability, lightness, flexibility, and quickness. These qualities are proper for wisdom development. It sees the phenomena with impartiality, and will not interfere with what it sees. This mind is free from lust, anger, and delusions. It has proper stability and concentration. Use this type of mind to observe phenomena. When the mind is stable and impartial, wisdom will develop quickly. Practice will not take much time. Most time is actually spent preparing the mind to be ready to develop wisdom. Once the mind is ready, not much time is needed to be successful. It is like building a nuclear weapon. It takes many years of research and development to build one. But once you have built it, deploying it and seeing results takes very little time. Our long practice is the practice to obtain the right samadhi, stability and concentration. Once the mind has it, the mind will be powerful. This powerful mind does not take much time to develop wisdom. With enough wisdom, the mind's impurities will be eradicated. Some people take seven years to attain anagami ship, non-returner or arahant ship, fully enlightened. Some people take seven months to attain anagami ship or arahant ship. Some people take seven days. Some people take a day. Meaning attaining results on the same day they start practicing. That is quick. Their minds have good quality. The mind without quality is like a dull knife. Using a dull knife to cut wood only makes sound but makes no woodcutting progress. The wood is not splitting. So, we have to be diligent and mindful. Every day, resolve to keep the five precepts. And make time for a formal practice. Choose a practice object. Today, I talked about many practice objects, like mindfulness of death. Frequently being mindful of death brings peace. Once the mind is calm and peaceful, be mindful of the body. Practice perceiving and examining. The impermanence, conflict and decay, and non-self characteristics of the body. Be mindful of the mental objects. See that they are also impermanent, in conflict and decay, and non-self. Once the mind is skillful, perception of trilaksana, the three characteristics, will occur automatically. These observations occur in a flash. When wisdom occurs, it also occurs in a flash. If your wisdom can examine things for hours, that is a wisdom that results from thoughts. Bhavana Maya Pong Ya Wisdom that comes from direct experience occurs in a flash. For example, when you are brushing your teeth and mindfulness arises, the mind will see the non-selfness of the body. The body is not of a human, a living being, mine, or someone else's. When the understanding happens, it does so in a flash. But you may need to practice for a long time for this flash to happen. It takes a long time to develop the mind. 
to have sufficient quality to see the true nature of the body. Go practice. I have lectured until I almost ran out of my voice. When I was younger, I had a handsome voice. Right now, the voice is hoarse. Seeing many people dedicating themselves to practice makes my effort worth it. Sometimes, you guys seem to be too engrossed in worldly matters. If that was the case, it would be the same thing to lecture to cats and dogs. It was useless. So, be diligent in your practice. You have an opportunity. Keep it up. Being mindless is wasteful. That is it for today. I plan to make it short. Since the doctor will give me a flu shot today. I also need to have an abscess removal surgery. Do you see the nature of the physical aggregate? Do not ask for my blessings. Do not ask me to bless you to be healthy and be free from this or that disease. Teachers also have sickness. Even the Buddha left his physical aggregate. Why cannot you get sick? You do not know when a sickness will occur, when you will die, when you will part from things you hold dear, or when you will meet unpleasant things. You do not know anything. Life is in darkness. How do we find out? We go ask fortune tellers. They then give us some inaccurate answers. Some are true, some are not. Some fortune tellers forget to look into their own fortunes, and they can suffer like we do. So, as a Buddhist, be smarter. Act worthy of the name Buddha, which means the knower, not full of delusions or superstition. Number one, you are very nervous. Do you know so? Number two is getting nervous, too, because it is time for number one. Now, Many people in line are getting nervous. Number one. I formally practice every morning and evening in walking and sitting postures. I use the body as the practice object. My work requires a lot of thinking, and my mind gets engrossed in it easily. So it lacks strength. The mind wanders off often. I have a lot of ego and agitation. I want things to go my way and am addicted to beautiful physical things. Please advise. All of what you just said is the result of practice. Because of your practice, you really know what you are. That is good. Be mindful often, and you will understand. Eventually, you will see that the body and the mind are devoid of essence. What you are practicing is good. Allocating time for formal practice every day will make the mind gain strength. Let me see you observe your body. Since you said you use it as your practice object. Do you see that your mind gets absorbed in it? That is not using the body as your practice object. It leans into and over focus on the body. Now smile sweetly. Do you see that the mind is still over focusing on the body? You are smiling but the mind is too still. Wiggle. Do you feel the body wiggling? Nod. Do you feel that the body is nodding? This is how you use the body as the practice object, not like this. That is incorrect. The mind over focuses on the objects. Know the body. When it breathes, no so. When it moves, no so. When it is still, no so. This is incorrect again. Do you see that the mind is now stiff? Know the object with a natural mind.
Do you see your mind constantly changing? It alternates between being stressed from your control and being relaxed. Keep knowing so, and the stress will subside. There is no need to fix anything. Do you know the mind that wanders off to think? Know so. Do you see that once the mind knows so, the mind is relieved? That is the mind with samadhi, stability and concentration. That is the knowing mind. Once you know that the mind has wandered off to think, the knowing mind arises. You do not create it. It arises when you are free from delusions. Use this natural mind to know what the uncontrolled body is like. Do not use the stressed out mind to observe. You are starting to overfocus again, making the mind stiff. Do not make the mind still and stupid, it is useless and tiresome. It is Atakila Matha Nuyogo, self torture. You are starting to do it again. Know this phenomenon well. Otherwise, you will practice wrong samadhi, stability. If you had wrong samadhi, there is no wisdom. Wisdom is the immediate result of right samadhi. Wisdom does not arise from wrong samadhi. Once the mind is stiff, that is wrong samadhi. Your mind is getting stiff again. Do you know so? Keep observing this. Do you see that once you become mindful of it, the stiffness subsides? Once the stiffness is gone, know the body and the mind. Once the mind grabs and chokes the practice object, know so. Number 2. I have been stuck in stillness for 10 years. Once I know of it, I see that even the desire to practice is suffering. The mind let go and I started to see phenomena arising and ceasing in daily life. I see the mind and the body as independent objects that are not under my control. I see that I am suffering with something that does not exist. I am confused between the samadhi that I had before and after I got stuck in stillness. I feel that my practice has regressed, and samadhi arises without my control. Please advise. If you want the peacefulness kind of samadhi, pick a practice object that makes you happy. Happiness is the immediate cause of samadhi. But if you want the stable kind of samadhi, know the unstable mind that wanders around and is unstable. The mind wanders off to think a lot. Once it has done that, know so. A stable samadhi will result. What you have practiced is much better than previously. Previously, you only over-focused. You are getting better. Now, you just went back to overfocus. Do you know so? This is it. You are overfocusing and the mind is locked in. Do you notice that the mind is dull and stiff? Do not try to make the mind stiff. Why do I emphasize the right samadhi? Because almost all practitioners have wrong samadhi. Once they have the right samadhi, wisdom cultivation time until getting results is short. Number 1. Your mind wandered off to think. Do you know so? Number 2. You are sending your mind out to observe. Do you know so? Know the mind as it is. Let me see you formally practice like you normally do. Right here, do not try to control the mind too much. Or delusions will come in. It will be like dozing off. Be more mindful. Practice with mindfulness. Know the practice object. Otherwise, when the mind leans inward, you will doze off. It will be like you are half asleep, which is bad. That is a lazy samadhi.
Number 3. I use breathing as my practice object. I also silently recite Bhutto while breathing. I see the mind that wanders off to think. Sometimes, after I become mindful of that, the mind tries to dig in to find the cause. I find the mind that composes things burdensome, so the mind only observes. When I do a sitting practice for a long time, my legs hurt. I see the mind squirming and tell the body to change its posture. I see that the mind can compose things by itself. Once I see a lot of suffering, the mind lets go of doing things. I then become happy and soon become mindless. Is what I am practicing correct? What you are doing is okay, but do not lean towards lethargy. Your mind is addicted to leaning towards lethargy. Make sure the mind is truly awake, and do not compose this sluggishness, being half asleep. Can you see that this moment and the previous moment are different? Be like this moment and keep practicing. When you practice samadhi, stability and concentration, do it with mindfulness like this moment. Do not let the mind fall half asleep. Your practice is okay but the mind is dissatisfied with the body and everything. Know that it is so. Do you feel this boredom and dissatisfaction? Know so. Know the dissatisfaction. Know the boredom. The mind will then be impartial. This is a stage of practice where the mind becomes bored, dissatisfied, sad, and hopeless. Be mindful. Do not let this sadness and hopelessness overcome the mind. This world is not so beautiful or pleasant. We cannot escape it, but we must live with it. See the world full of suffering but become detached. The mind will then be happy peaceful, and impartial to everything. So, if the mind starts to slip into sadness, know so. Knowing so will make the mind detached. Number 4. I practice by chanting and doing sitting meditation for about 45 minutes. During daily life, I observe the mind that moves around all my six sensory inputs, trying to know which sense the mind is focusing on. Once the mind wanders off, I know so and start over. I have never entered absorption when doing sitting meditation. I keep knowing the mind that wanders off to think or be mindful of the breathing. Right before the moment of my death, how do I utilize what I have practiced? Your mind is skillful at cultivating wisdom. Occasional rest is needed when doing so. If you do not know how to rest, you can keep chanting and be mindful of the Buddha. Chant and remind yourself of the Buddha. Dharma, his teachings, and Sangha, his enlightened disciples. Stay with the objects that are calm and peaceful. Samadhi, stability and concentration, will improve. If you cultivate wisdom without resting, like what you have been doing, the mind will be too tired. So, rest with any object you like, like chanting and thinking about the Buddha. The mind will regain its delight and strength. Once the mind has strength, the mind will stably see itself. Arising and ceasing are the sensory inputs without leaning in to observe. The mind does not move among different sensory inputs. It rises, perceives, and ceases at one sense at a time. After seeing these phenomena for a while, the mind will be exhausted. That is time to practice peacefulness, like chanting. You can also have a personal short chant. Like Namo Tassa Pagavato Arahato Sama Sam Buadasa. When you have some free time, recite it to give your mind some rest. Being restful will make the mind fresh when cultivating wisdom. Cultivating wisdom without rest will make the mind diffused. Number 5. 
I think I can see Trilaxna, the three characteristics of phenomena, but I am not sure whether it is just my thinking. I see that I am very opinionated. When I am bored, my mind gets stuck in stillness, lethargy, despair, and sleepiness. Being mindful of death does not help. I am taking some psychiatric medication. Please advise me of the correct way to practice samatha, peacefulness. Observe the body. See that this body is not desirable. It consists of composites that hold itself together only temporarily. Take medication as prescribed by the doctor. It is a physical condition. So medication is needed for proper chemical balance in the brain. For practice, if you cannot observe anything else, observe the body. See the body breathing out and in. See the body standing, walking, sitting, and lying down. See that the body is an object being observed by the mind. It is not self nor yours. Keep observing with a relaxed mind. Practicing Dharma is not a panacea. There are many causes for illnesses. If the cause is from the mind, practicing Dharma can help. Some illnesses arise from kama, old deeds. Like, you have a genetic disposition to have a chemical imbalance in the brain. This needs physical treatment. Some illnesses arise from air and weather conditions. Exposing yourself to extreme temperatures can cause illness. Many things can cause illnesses. Some illnesses are caused by bad mental health. A depressed mind can cause physical exhaustion and hopelessness. The body may behave as if it had a bad physical illness. So, have a physician treat your body, and you take care of your mind. Observe the body often and see that it is not self or yours. It is your temporary residence. Is it useful? Yes, without a body, you cannot practice Dharma. You practice by observing the body and the mind. Regardless of your physical health, the body can be an object for you to study. Do not hate it. Number 6 I formally practice by seeing the body breathing and seeing the mind that wanders off to think. I do it every morning, but on some days, I feel sleepy, and my mindfulness is weak, especially the days I listen to you live. During the day, I practice by seeing the body and the mind. I see my anger, arrogance, and cockiness often. Am I practicing correctly? Yes. Keep observing your mind. Your mind is inclined to be full of views and opinions. The practice for this type is observing the mind. You will see that the mind is constantly changing. Notice how the mind changes when it changes the subject it is thinking about. Thinking of different people leads to different feelings. So, do not try to force it not to think. But when it does, be mindful of how the mind is. Number 7 I formally practice every morning and before bedtime. I use reciting Bhutto as my home base. During the day, sometimes I recite Bhutto, and I see the body working. I see that mind that wanders off to think. I see that anger arises frequently. Can I progress with this practice? You have already developed significantly. Previously, your mind was too still from fixating. So, keep knowing. Be mindful of the body. See that the body is not self. See that the mind can work by itself, and its non-self nature. Be mindful often. Praise the Buddha and chant to gain peacefulness and strength.
Once you have some peacefulness, start observing the body and mind again. You have made good progress. You were previously full of views and opinions. It is better now and the mind is more awake. Number 8 Previously, I had frequent headaches. When I become mindful, I see the body stressed and tense when I work. Once I know so, the tension subsides. When I meditate, the mind will be overfocused at first and will slowly relax. The initial overfocusing causes a big headache and prevents me from practicing samadhi. I want to fix this overfocusing symptom, so I can practice samadhi when the body is unwell. Overfocusing is the result of greed. Wanting to be good, knowing, seeing, being something, being good, or practice. Once greed takes over the practice, or you want to be constantly mindful. Self-control will result. Tension rises. So, be mindful of the mind. When you think of practice, see that the mind wants to practice. Then practice. Do not stop practicing when the desire to practice subsides. That is not the way. We will practice without the desire to practice. What causes stress and tension is that desire, which is not part of the practice. The practice will not make you tense. But the desire to be good and to practice makes you oppress your body and mind. This is common for new practitioners. When they think of practice, they will see the act of bunching up and pulling in the scattered mind. Tension then rises. If you are mindful of the bunching up and pulling in, there will be no tension. If you are mindful of it, there will be no tension. Do not try to make the mind dull and sleepy. Sometimes, you want peacefulness, so you try to make the mind half asleep. That is not good. Be mindful. Luang Phu Ted said that mindfulness is essential everywhere, every time. Do not destroy it. Yes, this is good. Do you see that the mind is seeking objects? It keeps moving. No so. Know it like it is. Be comfortable. Do not try to make the mind still. Controlling causes headaches. This moment is good. Keep practicing. 